Continuing on with our outstanding guest speaker series, today we are pleased to present John Thiessen. John is archivist of the Mennonite Library and Archives and co-director of libraries at Bethel College, North Newton, Kansas. He is a graduate of Bethel and of Wichita State University with additional graduate work in history at the University of Kansas. He has been an archivist at Bethel since 1990. He is a member of the Academy of Certified Archivists, Society of American Archivists, Midwest Archives, and Society of Southwest Archives. He is the author or editor of several books, mostly most recently, European Mennonites in the Holocaust, which was uh, published by the University of Toronto Press. Uh, he has also twice helped lead Mennonite history tours to Poland. In addition to history, he also works in computer programming and software development. Today, he will present Introduction to Mennonites for Genealogists. It will give a very brief overview of who Mennonites are, and their history and geography and review the major archival and web resources for researching the genealogy of Mennonite families. So I would like to offer a warm virtual welcome to John. Thank you. Uh, first, I should check to make sure my audio and my screen share are coming through. Does that all look like it's working? Yes, they are. Okay. Well, as you can see, I gave this a sort of generic title of int Introduction to Mennonites for Genealogists. Sort of the obvious uh, question to start with is who are the Mennonites? Um, Mennonites are one of many religious denominations that originated in Europe in the 16th century during the time period that's usually referred to as the Reformation about 500 years ago. Um, this is along with a lot of other groups, Lutherans, Reformed, Episcopalians, etc. Mennonites are a much smaller group than any of these others. There are about 650,000 Mennonite church members in the U.S. Uh, currently. Um, that doesn't count children of Mennonite families, that only is counting adults and older teenagers. There's around 2.1 million or so worldwide. The largest number of those would be in Africa, actually. Some stereotypical Mennonite ideas or beliefs would be a, a, a free church, independent church, meaning uh, a church organization that isn't associated with government or with other you know, sort of society-wide uh, authority structures, you might say. Uh, baptism of adults rather than infants. Uh, there you sometimes hear a term that comes out of the 16th century called Anabaptist, which I'll come back to again in a little bit, uh, refusal of military service, uh, refusal to swear formal oaths as in uh, court uh, settings. Uh, I refer to these ideas as stereotypical because not all Mennonites believe all of these things and Mennonites share a number of these ideas with other groups such as Quakers and Church of the Brethren related groups and so on. There are lots of different Mennonite denominations and subgroups and splinter groups, just like there are with Baptists and Methodists and, and Mormons and other denominations. But what we're intending to talk about here is really who are the Mennonites genealogically speaking. And in the present day, clearly the vast majority of Mennonites around the world are not of, not of European background, all kinds of different ethnic backgrounds. And actually, Mennonites of non-European background do pursue their own genealogy. It's not just a European thing. And actually, a few years ago, I was in a conversation with uh, Felipe Inahosa and his cousin, the author you mentioned at the beginning here, where uh, they were talking about uh, his cousin's research and some of their uh, uh, ancestral, shared family ancestral backgrounds. Um, you know, Felipe was, was in some ways the typical academic historian who was less interested in this genealogical stuff, but his cousin had pursued this uh, stuff in depth. Um, but anyway, earlier generations, if you go back 150 years or more, Mennonites were really most, mostly of German and Dutch ethnic background. But Mennonites have never really been as closed a group as they think or as other people think. There's always been a trickle of people, outsiders joining in and many people uh, departing from the group also. 
Some other terminology you might uh, hear or run across is worth uh, mentioning at least. The word Anabaptist is one I've mentioned already, which literally means rebaptizer. It's more a theological identification than a group name like the, the other terms that are here, but it refers back to the 16th century theological beliefs, um, especially baptism of adults. Some people in the present like to use that term Anabaptist because they think it hides the ethnic and historical connotations of the word Mennonite in favor of more abstract ideas. And there are some other groups besides Mennonites that appeal to the 16th century Anabaptists. For example, uh, some Baptists look to that 16th century Anabaptist group as part of their historical origins. And uh, interestingly, there were Anabaptist groups in Eastern Europe who didn't become part of the Mennonite or Baptist traditions, uh, such as in Poland especially, but that's maybe a detail you didn't really need to know. Um, another term is Amish. That's a Mennonite related group that people are really most likely to have heard of. You know, the horses and buggies and plain dress and all of those sorts of things. Although there's a really wide range of Amish practices from rather strict rejection of modern technology all the way across to those who drive cars and use other kinds of technology within certain limitations. Hutterites is another uh, less commonly known group, although if you live in the Western US or Western Canada, you may have run across this. Um, those are a communal group, sort of like a monastic community in that they have a lot of their property in common and they off operate communal enterprises uh, usually agricultural or light manufacturing. They're actually fairly widely spread in the Western US and Western Canada, uh, unlike monastic groups in the sense that they live as families in, the, in their communal residences. So the, for purposes of genealogy, there are really two main points of origin in Europe for Mennonites. The Netherlands up here in the north, I think you can see my cursor, and then German speaking areas of Switzerland and, and neighboring areas in what is now Germany and France, so down in this area. The name Mennonite comes from, the, from Menno Simons, who was a priest in Friesland, now part of the Netherlands, who left the Catholic Church and became a leader of already existing religious dissident groups and helped to shape them along the lines of what are now seen as Mennonite beliefs. And he himself, never used the designation Mennonite as far as I know. He didn't call his associates after himself. And uh, interestingly, Simons is a patronymic, which might interest you genealogically. It's not a surname. So uh, he didn't have a surname in the uh, modern sense. Let's go back to the map here. So in Menno is from the north here, the northern part of the Netherlands, in the southern German-speaking regions down around Switzerland, there were various dissident groups that arose in and near many of the cities, Zurich and Augsburg and Strasbourg, um, a few examples. These groups gradually came in contact with each other and gradually developed a, a sense of commonality without really having a single leader as a focus like Menno Simons. And the Hutterites originated in this region too as part of that uh, Southern German speaking territory and Austrian ruled territory is they're named after a Jacob Hutter who advocated what he saw as a biblical requirement to hold property in common. So these things were going on in the 1520s and 1540s, uh, Menno Simons and the, the Swiss and South German groups originating these northern and southern groups were aware of each other and gradually came to see each other as kind of kindred spirits, but they remained <clears throat> largely separate for centuries. You could probably say that the southern group didn't really adopt the term Mennonite until the 18th century, maybe even the early 19th century. Mennonites are a decentralized uh, group with not a hierarchical group, more of a network than a hierarchy. And so the Amish, 
again, are a group that came out of the Southern Swiss group, but quite a bit later. So 1693 is usually the year given as the origin of the Amish uh, and a conflict over strictness in certain kinds of practices, such as patterns of clothing and, and uh, how uh, you treat outside groups and so on, how you treat dissenters within your own group. Um, neither the Netherlands or the Switzerland and South German areas were especially friendly to religious dissidents in that time period. And so people dispersed to places where their uh, religious practices would be tolerated or ignored. And sometimes when they moved to new locations, they absorbed similar groups in the places that they moved to. So the Netherlanders tended to move east along the, the North Sea and Baltic Sea coast. So along this region out to uh, what is now present day Poland, the Swiss groups, South German groups tended to expand mostly into their regional areas up to the north and a little bit west here. But people of one kind of Mennonite connection or another came to North America as early as 1683, the Germantown story, if you're uh, familiar with Pennsylvania history, there were large numbers that immigrated to North America from this Southern region already in the early 1700s. And up until 1874, almost all of the Mennonite migrants to North America came from that Swiss and South German region. So among the Northern group up here, the migration in that that 18th century time period tended to go farther east. Instead of west to North America, there were large number, numbers that moved from the, the Vistula Delta here, the Donsk, Gdansk region, out into uh, the Russian Empire in what is uh, present day Ukraine. So, you know, that's off of my map here, but down, down in this region. And then within really less than a century after that migration, which started in the 1780s, then in the 1870s, large numbers of the people in, in Eastern Europe started moving then again to North America and became part of the larger Germans from Russia uh, ethnic group, which uh, you may have heard of, which included not just Mennonites, but Catholic and Protestant ethnic Germans leaving Russia and various places in Eastern Europe and looking for new uh, settlement locations. And so that, you know, a lot of people in the Western states at least seem to know something about the, the Germans from Russia story vaguely or have run into that ethnic group. But it's, it's interesting the case that there's more to that story uh, chronologically. There was another large wave of Mennonite and German immigration that left the Soviet Union in the 1920s going to North and South America. And then another wave again in the 1940s. Uh, and then yet another wave finally after 1990. And most, <clears throat> most of those immigrants stayed in Germany rather than coming to the Americas. And actually there are relatively few Mennonites left now in Russia and Ukraine, although there are still a few. So to simplify or oversimplify, there are really two groups to keep in mind for genealogical purposes. What might usually be called the Swiss Mennonites, which includes the Amish, and then what are often called the Russian Mennonites, which oddly enough includes the Hutterites who happen to go east instead of going west uh, from the South German area. Obviously these terms are, are oversimplifications since the Swiss category don't all trace back to Switzerland and the Russian category doesn't all trace back to Russia or Netherlands. Uh, these are synecdoches if you're an, a literary person, a part of the group is used as a shorthand for the whole group. And now I wanna turn more uh, directly to genealogy. Um, during the time I've been an archivist, family history research has really changed dramatically and that might be worth something, uh, might be worth talking about in the, in the question and answer session if we have time is what, what kinds of changes have you seen in 
how genealogy research is done over the time period you've been involved in it. Let me switch screens here. The most obvious change has been the move to online web-based research. And it's sort of frustrating that people seem to have lost the idea that there's anything other than ancestry. Nowadays, I often run into people whose searches start and stop with ancestry. And um, I don't mean to interrupt, but I just want to make sure that you knew that this, the screen that's showing is that slide that says to oversimplify. Is that the oh, screen? No, I was trying to switch to... Um, my web browser, did that not come through? No, it didn't come through. Uh, let's see here. You're, you're sharing that one screen, not your entire screen. Oh, I see. I need to switch my screen share. You should be able to reset that by using the green button that says share screen. Is there, it com there. Now coming in now? Okay. okay. Perfect, thank you. So in my archives here, we've got around around 17 million pages of physical material, not to mention electronic records, and maybe about 1.5% of that has been scanned and posted on our website. And I suspect we're well ahead of a lot of other smaller local archives. Um, our most important family history sources, church membership books and family documentation put together by individuals are completely absent from ancestry as far as I know. Nevertheless, there are two specifically Mennonite related sites that are now the vital starting point for Mennonite history and genealogy, family history these days. One is this one, uh, which goes by the acronym GRANDMA, which I think maybe somebody ought to be punished for coming up with that uh, acronym. Genealogical Registry and Database of Mennonite Ancestry. This focuses really on the Russian Mennonite cluster, it was begun in the early 1990s by the California Mennonite Historical Society. I've done a lot of data entry for this database, although I wasn't a founder or, a, or an administrator for it. I started doing data entry in, in late 1993 already with a focus on church membership records from 1870s immigrants uh, to the Plain States here. This project was originally distributed on CD, although now obviously the website is the main focus. And it's a, a paid site, which is primarily done, I think, for privacy related reasons. Um, but nevertheless, you have to sign up to have access to it, although there is some some limited guest access. You can see there's a, a link for guest access. Some Mennonite focused libraries such as mine have subscriptions so that in-house library users can use it for free. And I don't know if you need to know this, but when it was on CD, they used the shareware genealogy, genealogy software program, Brothers Keeper, which maybe some of you have heard of. That's independent of the Grandma Project, but that was widely used by people who were doing data entry when it started. One interesting feature of this project is that it has a system for bringing together variant versions of names. Um, normally you think of Soundex and its, and its cousins for doing that sort of thing, but this one is focused specifically on the, the content, the, you know, the idiosyncrasies of the content that is found in this database, uh, bringing widely variant spellings of surnames and variant spellings of first names together so that uh, searching is somewhat simplified. And another uh, feature of this project that's significant is that it's a single lineage link database. And the reason I mentioned that particular detail is that the other of the two major Mennonite sites is this one, the Swiss Anabaptist Genealogical Association or Saga, which focuses obviously on the Swiss uh, Mennonite cluster. Uh, that one is not just a single database, it's a collection of 58 databases that the last time I looked at the numbers with 6.4 million names, uh, 
which means there's scads of duplicates in there and makes uh, searching uh, quite a bit more complicated. But anyway, I'm a little less familiar with the inner workings of this one. And there is some overlap between the two projects because obviously those two Mennonite subgroups aren't, aren't sealed off from each other. This one was the, the confluence of several projects that had been going on already about 1990 or so computerizing Swiss, you know, as they would refer to it, Swiss Mennonite genealogical data. Uh, in the URL, you'll see that OMII, they originally called themselves Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois. But in 2002, they changed their, their focus to, as they say, Anabaptists who originated in Switzerland. And two earlier sort of local focuses for their work were Kidron, Ohio and Bern, Indiana. Those were, were two large databases that were merged into this project. They also have a large Amish database or multiple Amish databases. This one hasn't, hadn't ever gone the, the CD route. The, this one has always been an online website. Um, they also run an email list, which the Grandma Project doesn't. Um, they haven't adopted the, the process of trying to standardize variant spellings of surnames and first names. Uh, so again, you've got, um, you've got some obstacles that that puts in the way of, of comprehensive, easy searching. So those are really the two major genealogy sites, but there's several others that are of uh, quite a bit of interest as resources. Uh, one is this one, um, MennoniteGenealogy.com is a huge collection of lists basically maintained in Canada, focusing on the Russian Mennonite cluster, although not that exclusively, lots of transcribed sources, uh, it's not lineage linked, so that makes uh, searching a little bit more um, a little bit more labor intensive. Um, there doesn't seem to really be an equivalent of this for the Swiss cluster, um, although I think, especially the Canada section of this, probably has some of the some Swiss related sources on it. And for the Russian Mennonite cluster, there are also some Germans from Russia sites that cover both Mennonites and other ethnic Germans from Eastern Europe, such as one that's called odessa3.org, which maybe some of you have looked at before. Obviously, there are also Mennonite DNA projects. This MennoniteDNA.com focuses on, again, on the Russian group. Um, again, there doesn't quite seem to be an exact equivalent for to this for the Swiss Mennonite group, although there is a family tree DNA site that's called Mennonite and Amish immigrants. And for the, the Swiss Mennonite group, there are quite a few surname specific DNA sites, you know, Hostetlers and Yoders and so on, where there are sites focusing on, on specific surnames in the DNA. And DNA is maybe another topic for uh, discussion and if there's time be curious to hear other people's experiences with working on uh, DNA genealogy projects. Um, let's see here. Another important cluster of websites to consider is obituary indexes and similar collections of biographical material. We maintain one here using MediaWiki software, which is the same thing that Wikipedia is based on. Um, so wide variety of periodicals and other sources that we've drawn uh, obituaries and biographical sketches from. Another significant obituary site is this Menobits, which focuses again more on the Swiss and Amish groupings. Um, so very useful information here. Um, there are several smaller obituary projects that are out there on the web, which usually focus on a, a single 
specific periodical. Um, there's some obviously some overlap among the sites. And these kinds of obituary sites are really more balanced, I think, in covering all kinds of Mennonites, both Russian and Swiss, and Mennonites not of either of those groups, and also non-Mennonites who happen to be noted, noted in Mennonite periodicals or were prominent in Mennonite communities. And as most of you probably know, obituaries are a relatively recent innovation. They're not all that common in newspapers before about the 1880s or so. And they're still fairly unusual for the average person until after World War I. So you don't find, don't find many obituaries or death notices for people in say 1820, unless they were really prominent. And much of the, the websites I've just gone through, Grandma Saga obituary indexes, a lot of that data I think is not found, at least not in an obvious form in ancestry. You have to look elsewhere. Another useful site to mention yet is this one called GAMEO, Global Anabaptist Mennonite Encyclopedia Online. It's not really genealogy, strictly speaking, but it's a good starting point for background information, uh, contextual information, when you, if you happen to be hunting for possibly Mennonite connected people. So some other kinds of sources that uh, would relate to Mennonite genealogy, especially things that aren't on the web. And a lot of these I think may be obvious to those of you who've been doing genealogy for some time already. Um, let's get back to the um, get back to the PowerPoint here. That's not the one I want. So some of these types of sources may be obvious to people who've been doing uh, genealogy for quite a while. An important source for Mennonites particularly is church membership records. Um, a lot of these have been entered into the Grandma and Saga databases, but this is, this is not a process that has been fully completed yet. This is somewhat more of a tradition among the Russian Mennonite group rather than the Swiss cluster. Among the Russian cluster, the church records can go as far back as the 1770s. And this one uh, dates roughly from that time period. And in a few cases, there are things that survive from earlier than that. Among the Swiss, it's, a, it's more a tradition, more than a North American tradition of the 19th century. And as I said earlier, Mennonites don't have a strong centralized uh, system. So there's no one place where church records end up being put, but the various archives try to gather them either the originals or copied forms such as microfilms. And in the Russian cluster, there are some record books that go back to Russia itself and to the Vistula Delta, the President de Gdansk area. Uh, and you might uh, be sort of curious about this. A lot has been turned up in the former Soviet Union in the last 30 years, but the Mennonite church record books from Russia are still surprisingly scarce. And I suspect that in many cases, they weren't diligently maintained in the first place. And of course, some have probably been lost over time. And a good number of these uh, church membership books, such as this one, have been scanned and posted online. Uh, so some of them can be found, um, found elsewhere. I quickly go back to another online source here. Another source that's worth taking some time to investigate, I've found, is photo collections. We have a fairly, here at our archives, have a fairly extensive uh, set of photos, many of them of individual people. Um, and that's often wor worth checking into to see if you can find uh, clues to families that you're searching for. Um, I'm not sure how often people take the time to go specifically hunting in archives for photos, but it's worth, it's worth looking at that.
So another thing to think about, which you may have had some experience with already, is personal papers in the archives of earlier leaders and researchers. Um, our collections have uh, a variety of uh, personal papers collections from various Mennonite uh, leadership people and, and just members of the community who happen to be good record keepers. Sometimes you find genealogical materials specifically in these kinds of collections. Some of the collections themselves actually come from genealogists, uh, but even non-genealogist collections will contain correspondence and diaries and more photos or financial and legal papers and things that might give clues about extended families. Obviously books and periodicals are on Mennonite history are things we still point people to. Um, history is worthwhile to figure out the context of what your individual ancestors were experiencing, what was going on around them, what things they might have participated in, and what things they might have been connected to. And usually it'll be difficult to find out about individual ancestors without knowing, about, knowing quite a bit about the history of their times and places. Um, newspapers and magazines are often very local, at least that's been my experience, to have a very focused audience, such as ones directed specifically at Mennonites, like a lot of the things we have. And these are often not represented online very well yet, or not at all yet. And obviously already published genealogies are something you've had some experience looking at. Uh, many, of the, many of these are not very widely held, so any particular local library could possibly have some that you haven't, uh, haven't had a chance to see before. Let's see. Maps are another thing that are at least interesting to look at and can sometimes give you some good uh, genealogical clues. Um, obviously, we've c collected maps in our holdings here of uh, regions that happen to be of interest to, uh, to Mennonites of various kinds. Um, this is a region in what's now Ukraine that's represented on this 1836 map. But again, maps which is probably well known to, to uh, a good number of you already. Maps are something that were worth uh, looking into when you're looking for clues to uh, mystery ancestors. It's also worthwhile to try and think outside the box to some extent. I wanna show you one more here. that is maybe a little bit outside the box. We have a fairly extensive recorded oral history collection here. So one of our focuses was World War I draftees. So we have a, a large collection of recorded interviews done with World War I draftees from our area or from our denomination done in the 60s and early 70s. Uh, those have the potential to be a useful genealogical source if you happen to find a recorded interview with someone uh, who connects to your family and uh, people find it, uh, I suppose, uh, an emotional re revelation in some ways to suddenly discover a recording of their grandfather or great grandfather talking about his, uh, his experiences. There. So here's our nice facility. Some things I sort of summarize to people when I talk about genealogy is that not everything is online. If you want to do more than a casual, easy search for ancestors, you probably need to go to traditional physical format sources at some point. And in the world of potential Mennonite genealogical sources, probably most of it isn't online yet. And as I said earlier, we have something like 17 million pages and 
probably less than 2% has been digitized, partly because that's I'm because that's because I'm the one who stands at the at the scanner doing the digitizing and I'm the one who uploads it to the website. One consideration for uh, Mennonite research in particular is that a lot of the material before approximately the 1920s is in German, uh, also a few other languages, but that emphasizes the potentially multilingual nature of uh, genealogical research, research and resources, and particularly that's true among Mennonites. So one other comment, there's a surprising number of Mennonite archives and libraries scattered around North America. Some are located at colleges, Bethel and Tabor in Kansas, Fresno Pacific in California, Goshen in Indiana, Eastern Mennonite in Virginia, Canadian Mennonite in Manitoba, Bluffton University in Ohio, and there are a few uh, archives and libraries at denominational offices, such as Mennonite Church USA denomination in Elkhart, Indiana. And some of the Mennonite collections are at local or regional museums or historical and genealogical associations. So there's actually a surprising a number of, uh, of institutions around scattered around North America that do some kind of Mennonite related research. And my concluding slide here is our uh, location on the college campus. And I think what I'd like to do now is switch over to comments and questions and interaction. I've sort of given a very generic overview and let's go, let's go to some interaction and questions at this point. Okay, John, I see in the chat box, um, one of the uh, patrons in the, the session today has asked, how are Mennonites related to Quakers? I understand they were Protestants. Yeah. And there's, there's not really a historical connection between Mennonites and Quakers, but there's theological connections in the sense that, that some of the sort of themes or special emphases of Mennonites and Quakers are very similar. Uh, refusal of military service, refusal to, to swear oath, formal oaths in legal settings, um, you know, some of that sort of thing. Um, Quakers are primarily a, an English origin uh, group historically. Um, Mennonites are primarily a, a continental Europe, a Germanic origin group. So, you know, their, their theological similarities, but the sort of historical sources are, are in different regions. Okay. And I'll, I'll open the mic to the class. If, you, if any of you have a question for the guest speaker, uh, please um, unmute your microphone, but leave your cameras off. And while I'm waiting for them, I have a few things that I, I kind of jotted down. First mm -hmm. of all, um, are, are your collections on archive grid? No. Uh -uh. Okay. We would like to do that, but we haven't. We haven't had the staff time to focus on that. A few of our collections are in, um, and to go into library jargon, a few of our collections are in OCLC. And those are primarily ones that were entered into the Nukmuk collection way back when, when that was a thing. The National, was that National Union Catalog of Manuscript Collections? That was something from the 60s, I think. And I think those ended up getting put into the OCLC database. But um, no, most of our stuff is not out there except on our, our own website and to a limited extent in OCLC. Okay, so, so like Family Search hasn't come and offered to digitize any of your collection or, or ancestry.com? Well, we had some, some conversations along those lines, but, but I couldn't 
I mean, we couldn't quite come to the same kind of understanding about um, about public accessibility. I mean, I'm, you know, we were perfectly happy to have people do some digitizing of some of our early records, but I was not willing to put any kind of limitations on what other individual researchers could do. You know, if some person doing research on a family wanted to come in and transcribe a particular church record and publish that transcription on the on the web somewhere, I wanted to allow that to happen, but that seemed to be problematic for the discussions we were having. There was a desire for more exclusivity. I see. Okay. And I'm I'm not sure I under I mean it all seemed a little unclear to me. I'm not sure that I was understanding what they were saying correctly, but in any case, that didn't really go anywhere. Okay. Um, another question in the chat box, is there a list of Mennonite surnames anywhere? Hmm, that's an interesting question. On, maybe on that grandma website, well, maybe both were, maybe both the grandma site and the saga site have some kind of a reference to that somewhere in their, their background information. The Gameo site, the online encyclopedia may also have, have that, uh, have some lists like that also. But having said that, I would also say that there aren't any surnames that are exclusively Mennonite. There's some that are widely found in Mennonite communities, but but there's nothing that's nothing that's a guarantee that that person comes from some kind of Mennonite connection. I see. Okay. You know, I was going to ask if you don't mind kind of like showing the class a little bit about that grandma website, even though it is a paid uh, portal. Uh, uh, it does seem me, like it's a quite an important resource. Yeah, let me go back there and um, do a search on it just so you can see what it looks like. It's showing up right, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay. They've redone their user interface recently, so I'm not used to putting my mouse in the right location yet. So you can do individual searches. So let's do one that will get a lot of hits. I'll do So we got it says we got 653. I would have expected a couple thousand, but in any case, you see variant spellings of the first names here. Uh, the stuff is in roughly chronological order. Um, I'll proceed down the list here and look for something that might be particularly interesting. I see the birth and date, death dates, but what are those on the far right hand side where it says like number sign? And then it gives like a series of six numbers. What do those represent? Each of the people in the database just has a ID number, so you can keep track of. You know, are we talking about John Schmidt number four eight four nine four three, or are we talking about John Schmidt number three seventy three eight ninety? You know, you can, if you want to go to a specific person, you can use that number. And not have to go through the search screen to to get to people. Oh. So partly it's for computer purposes to identify each individual, but partly it's convenience on the part of the user to to um, you know locate, identify a particular person. Let me just pick somebody. Here you can see the Smiths are are integrated with the Schmitz of various spellings too. I don't know who this one is. Let's 
see what turns up. So for an individual, you get a display like this, the basic data, parents, spouses, children's names, some notational infra source and notational information. Um, you can click on a tree, which gives you the, the tree format chart here with the basic dates and names and dates. Um, let's go back to the individual page. Um, you can click the links and, and follow the individual family links. And some of the, you know, some of the links are in the notation section, like some of them will have find a grave links if people have, have put that kind of data into the, into the database. Um, so there's a variety of, um, a variety of kinds of reports and formats and so on. One of the interesting ones that's of relevance in, um, in small communities, small intervaried communities like Mennonites, as you hear, you can do a relationship search. So you can put in two, two different people and discover that they are, you know, third cousins once removed and sixth cousins and seventh cousins twice removed. It'll give you a, if the data is in, in the database, it'll connect, you know, explain how the people are, uh, how the people are interconnected with each other. So that's, I, mean, I don't know how useful that is in a broad perspective, but it's at least entertaining. Um, Wonderful. You know, you, you, the other websites, if you don't mind kind of just touching on them, because I, I know I, I was certainly curious about, you know, kind of looking into them and seeing how, you know, the, the value of looking for them for genealogical information. Mm -hmm. The Saga website, you mean? The, mm -hmm. the one I have up now, let me see if it will like me today. See if it will. believe that I have a password. Let's go to the advanced search. That's what I normally use when I'm on this site. So see here, here you can uh, search by a variety of categories, which, you know, those are mostly the same categories you can use on the, on the uh, grandma database. Um, you can use Soundex here but sometimes it doesn't, doesn't help you if the names are variants of each other, but don't quite sound close enough to, to, um, to uh, be the, the same. I often use a, this default contains, just use a, a few letters of the first name and surname if I don't know additional stuff like birth years and so on. So we'll see what kind of listing comes up here. This can be a little bit of a slow website. So here you got 2000 hits for uh, John Hostetler. And here it, it picks out middle names too. So that's that adds more that you need to uh, sort your way through. Let me pick somebody who might be might be interesting. Go jump forward a few pages here. So here on the the far column, it indicates all the different databases. So, you know, here you've got the same John Hostetler appearing in at least four different databases. Here you've got, you know, ones that may all be the same person appearing in multiple databases. But in any case, let's click on one of them to see what you get on the individual. 
individual database, different format, but the same kind of thing, parents and family members. Um, some information on sources, although I've found that the Saga database doesn't have quite as much detail on sources as the, the Grandma Dace database often does. But again, you can get things on ancestors. Um, I'm not sure what all, yeah, it gives a descendancy, descendancy chart as a timeline which is kind of interesting. So, you know, a variety of, of options for displaying the data in the Saga database. Okay, I've got another question in the chat box. Um, Elizabeth came in late, but she says she hopes that you hadn't, may not have covered this before. Uh, she wanted to know what states were common for Mennonites to settle in. And can we assume the states you listed that have Mennonite colleges are those that have a higher Mennonite population than other states? Yeah, I think you can assume that. Uh, you know, Pennsylvania was really the first one, 1683 and Germantown story and everything associated with that. But um, Midwestern states have, tend to have pretty large Mennonite and Amish populations. Um, uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, uh, Iowa to a lesser extent. The Plain States got a lot of the sort of Russian, so-called Russian Mennonite cluster. So Kansas and Nebraska and South Dakota and in Canada, Manitoba particularly. So those are really kind of the, the core states for thinking about Mennonite locations. And actually, I think Kansas has the highest percentage of Mennonites in its overall population. Although, you know, since Kansas only has about 3 million people, it doesn't add up to a, a very large number of people. There are a lot more Mennonites by number in places like Pennsylvania and Ohio and Indiana. But percentage wise, probably around somewhere between 1 and 2% of the Kansas population is some variety of Mennonite. What would clue one in that your ancestor may have been a Mennonite? I mean, what is there like a particular thing to look for? What clues would there be if you had no idea whether you had them or not? I'm not sure there is anything very clear, just you know, just sort of looking at someone out of the blue. I mean, surnames would tend to make you think about it, but like I said, there's no, there's no surname that, you know, is exclusively Mennonite. So, you know, that's, that's not a, that's only something to make you consider the possibility, not, not something to, to, um, make you think it's necessarily likely. Uh, regional things, you know, sort of Pennsylvania Dutch regions, you know, in Pennsylvania sort of regional origins, then again, that's no, no conclusive issue, but it's something that, you know, opens up the probability you know, or the possibility of that's something to consider whether or not the person might be Mennonite and whether Mennonite resources might offer you some data to, to add to what you know. So yeah, that's, that's kind of an interesting question that I haven't really, really thought of in quite those terms because usually people come to me either already thinking that their ancestor is Mennonite or at least with the information that it's probable or possible that they were Mennonite and trying to determine that. So, you know, sometimes you get very surprising cases. Um, I had someone several years ago email and said they were trying to track down their 
uh, great grandfather or great great grandfather whose name was Benjamin Franklin Hamilton. And they claimed he was a Mennonite minister in Kansas back in like the 1870s or 80s. And I said, well, you know, that strikes me as highly unlikely given the name. And I said, are you sure the guy wasn't Quaker maybe? Cause you know, that would be a much more likely name for a Quaker minister than a Mennonite minister. And you know, the sort of theological ideas that they might have expressed would be somewhat similar. So, you know, that might cause that kind of overlap or confusion, but, you know, I acted appropriately and did my research. And it turns out that in fact, this person was correct. Benjamin Franklin Hamilton was a, a Mennonite minister in South Central Kansas back in the 1870s and 80s. Uh, migrated from Indiana or Ohio or something and, you know, was a Mennonite all of his life, not, a, not someone who joined uh, as a later adult or married into the community or something. So, you know, there are, it's dangerous to go by things like surnames because there are cases that, that just don't fit Understood. Um, you showed us in the presentation uh, some boxes of, of uh, like, for lack of a better word, but, but what we might call a pamphlet file. Mm -hmm. um, but what are the more popular collections that people come to look at in your in your archive? Well, probably really the most popular thing would be church membership books. Um, you know, since that has been an active practice among, among at least some Mennonite groups for a long time, that's kind of a primary source for, for getting at names and dates and family connections. Um, a, sequent, a second one is probably, probably newspapers and periodicals that would contain things like obituaries and, and you know, marriage notices and other kinds of, you know, community news items and so on. That's probably the second most, most widely used kind of collection. Well, that, that brings up the question, was there Mennonite newspapers? Yeah, there, there are a good number of, of Mennonite specific periodicals starting in the US back in, 1840s, maybe even the late 1830s in Eastern Pennsylvania. So that, that has a long tradition of, of, um, of member of newspapers intended specifically for a Mennonite audience, but then in many cases, those kinds of operations tended to spread out to either serve, you know, when they were published in German, for example, which the earliest one was, you know, serve other German reading people who are not Mennonites, or they sort of spread out to serve their local community, both Mennonite and, and non-Mennonite. So there are a lot of them that may be sort of marketed as Mennonite uh, affiliated kinds of um, kinds of projects, but really didn't stay that way. Although, you know, some of them retained the word Mennonite in their, in their periodical title over time. You know, another, going back to your question about what kinds of resources people use, another one that gets used here surprisingly often is um, alumni related material. You know, people say, um, I think my whatever grandparents, great grandparents attended the school and I want to find out about that. And so that's, that's kind of a, a surprising thing that people hunt for that kind of as often as they do. And, you know, that's another thing that maybe people don't think about genealogically 
as often as they should is is going after that kind of institutional participation kind of a, a source alumni or some some other kind of institutional affiliation like that that they might have you know a club membership or lodge membership would be another sort of parallel to that that a person's name and data might appear in Okay. Um, another question that's in the chat box is would cemeteries they are buried in be a clue? Yeah, there would be there would be some cemeteries that that are associated with Mennonite congregations. And so that would be that would in some ways probably be a more reliable clue than surnames and and well, I mean that's sort of the same as regional in a certain sense, but if you're looking at if you're looking at a person buried in a in the cemetery of the such and such Mennonite church, then that increases the probability that they had some Mennonite family connections to a pretty high level. I would say. Good. Okay. Um, now you had mentioned that you had digitized some records on your website. Do you mm -hmm. mind showing the class those records or at least kind of doing a, a short overview of them? Let's see here. Some of the stuff I had uh, showed you already. Let's see what's going to be the best place to look at. Some of the stuff is just kind of poorly linked, but let me show you some of the church record books, this would be one, one set of things that, that people go to more often than some others. Um, you know, I showed you the first page of this one already. Um, that's not the front cover. This is the page I showed you already in my PowerPoint. So one of the church uh, record collections. There's a whole list here of congregations that were in what's today the northern Poland region, or a few of them are farther east in, in eastern Poland or uh, western Ukraine. But um, you know, this one out of the Gdansk region. Um, Look at a clean page. This one actually goes back to, uh, if you can see the date here, this is uh, 1667, a list of baptisms in the Mennonite church in, in Gdansk. So a variety of, of other things that we've um, scanned off of. Microfilms had digitized some things that we've had, had digitized for us for ourselves. Um, this one is a little messy because it doesn't have a nice linking web, website for it, but um, we've done some digitizing of sources that people have compiled in Europe, um, some print materials. This one has a a long print introduction and then a whole slew of um, handwritten note cards. One of these kinds of gigantic um, note taking operations that people used to do in the pre computer days. So uh, here we're in the middle of the ends and Newfelt, Daniel Newfelt family and some data that you'd have to zoom in to really be able to decipher. So, you know, another non-church record kind of a, a collection, but that, that uh, set of scanning is a little bit on the messy side. Um, so in any case, the it's sort of embarrassing to say that a lot of the scanned material is 
um, not terribly well organized because I'm the only person that is able to spend time organizing it. So it almost requires um, asking me in person to guide you to the right, right section of the website. This is another nice looking one that we got from the Royal Library of Sweden. Uh, this also documents the um, Northern Poland region during the infamous set of Swedish Polish wars, there was a sort of census or property tax survey that was done in that region and the document ended up in the Swedish archives and because it it focuses on a region that had a lot of Mennonites in it, we uh, asked for a copy of that and got a, a nice colorful scan here of that, that set of documents. So, like I said, it's a little embarrassing that it's not any more well organized than it is, but there's a lot of stuff here and yet it's probably less than 2% of all the paper material we have. That brings me to my last question, at least. Um, how do the class, how do they reach out to you to get research help if they suspect that they have a Mennonite ancestor? Probably just go ahead and email me and I can, and I can take a look at their questions and see if I'm the right person to help or if I need to refer them to someone else. You know, for example, Pennsylvania, Mennonite genealogical questions, they're two big uh, Pennsylvania Mennonite collect, uh, collections or repositories that I refer people to. They're the experts on that material. So I can refer people to, to those other places that might have more, uh, more expertise than I do about a particular question. But yeah, just, just to get in touch with me and I can, and I can, provide you with some leads to follow up. Wonderful, okay. Let me give the class one last minute. Uh, any, any other questions that you'd like to ask our guest speaker today? If you'd like, you can unmute your microphone or you can put it into the chat box. We'll give it a few seconds here. Okay, that looks like it. Uh, before I say goodbye, uh, John, uh, let me just remind the class that if you want to download the chat box, uh, if you're not going to stay for the next hour of class, uh, don't forget to do that. You can do that by clicking on the three little dots uh, that are in the chat box at the bottom of the chat box, or you can just copy and paste the entire chat box and then just put it into an email and mail it to yourself. Uh, just a reminder that once you log out, you will lose the chat box, so I don't want you to, to have that happen. And then with that, I'm going to go ahead and John say thank you very much for your time and your expertise. Okay. Um, I know I learned a lot. I, I have not yet found a Mennonite ancestor in my uh, research. However, I do have a German line that I have not mm -hmm. yet researched. So uh, I might just find one yet. <laughs> well, so, if, you, if you trace back to colonial era Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania Dutch families then the probabilities increase quite a bit that there might be Mennonites scattered among those families somewhere. Wonderful, thank you. I, I will keep that in mind. Oh, I think that, that that particular line I'm going to be saving for retirement because it's uh -huh. a it's a dead end that's been a dead end for many many decades for many people who've researched that line. So, uh, but anyhow, thank you very much. We really appreciate it, and I will be sending you the link to our YouTube channel with your recording. And with that, um, I will say goodbye and mm. thanks very much. I'll just let the class know if you're going to stay for the next hour. Uh, please stay online. If you're not, go ahead and, and click the red in button and that will take you out. And once again, thank you, John. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.